before you. We thank you for your presence here in this place. We thank you that there is either, neither life nor de death, angels nor demons, no powers or principalities that can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. And that remains the same. No matter what's changing around us, your word tells us you are the same yesterday, the same today, and forever. And Lord, we are so grateful for that. And we want to adore you and honor you in our, our songs, in what we do and say here in this place and when we leave this place today. May everything we do be a reflection of your self-sacrificial love, Lord God. We pray all these things in the name that is above every name, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Good to be with all of you this morning. All right, so today, uh, what we're doing is we're going to be wrapping up a, a letter that we've been examining over the last several weeks, a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians, a struggling young church in the first century city of Corinth. And if you've been following with us at all throughout this series, you know that Corinth was a highly immoral city. It was a, a sexually charged city. It was a city that was obsessed with, with personal liberties and freedoms. Sounds, I don't know, a little familiar, right? To say the least. So we're in our final week where we're examining Paul's letter, and we're going to be looking at the final words that he gives to this young church in, in Corinth. Now, this is a church that Paul helped start. He spent 18 months in this city getting to know people, building relationships with them. He preached the gospel, and then people came to faith. People came to know Christ, and they were transformed by, by the love of Jesus. They placed their hope in the finished work of Christ on the cross for their sins. But Paul receives this report once he left this church that uh, their move towards Christ-likeness, their efforts towards Christ-likeness have, have drifted. And now what Paul is doing is he's making this effort to provide course correction and to, to help build unity within this body that had become so divided. And there were a whole series of issues that were creating divisiveness in this church, and we've examined many of them. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 this morning. So if you have a Bible, feel free to, free to turn there, whether it's digital or it's physical. Now, when, when we hear the final words to, towards us from someone we love, those are words that we want to stand up and pay attention to, right? If we're reading a letter that they've written to us, or maybe it's that moment where they cross from this side of eternity to the next, typically those final words are critical and important for us uh, to remember. And I don't think it's any different for the final words that Paul gives to the Corinthian church. He closes off this letter by encouraging them to, to manage three key areas of their life. And these are areas that are relevant to us today. Even though we, we're not in the first century, we're in the 21st century. But like the Corinthian church, we all have to navigate these three areas. And those are money, plans, and relationships. Our money, our plans, and our relationships. Now, no matter where you are, no matter how far along you are in your spiritual journey, no matter what's going on in your life, I can bet, I don't bet, but if I were to bet, all the issues, the tensions, the struggles that are going on in your life right now, they come back to one of these three categories. You're having struggles with money. Plans aren't going the way you thought they would go. They had hoped they would go. And that's been the theme of 2020, right? Or your relationships are struggling. It's difficult. It's challenging for you, right? And so what Paul is going to do, he's going to, to tell the Corinthian church how to best steward these three things, but it's within the larger context of the message that he has been sharing with this group of people the entire letter. And that central message is this. Leverage what you have for the common good of others. Now remember, this is a group of people who are in Christ. They're, they are followers of Jesus. And so once they've crossed the line of faith, they've accepted the finished work of Christ, they now have a responsibility to each other. 
And that's what Paul is trying to drive them to. It's not about what you have the freedom to do. It's not about your personal liberties. It's not about what you can get away with or can't get away with in your life. It's about what you do for the well-being of those around you, for the common good of others. Now, it's no surprise to us that this past week, Erie County moved in from the yellow zone to the orange zone. And I don't know about you, but, but for me, when I receive news like this, my first temptation, I resisted the temptation this time, but my first temptation is to engage in something called doom scrolling. Anybody familiar with what doom scrolling is? Some of us are. You're, yeah, yeah. So uh, ex- essentially, it's the ex- excessive consumption of negative news stories. So you, you, you're, you're scrolling through your news feed, you find one negative news story, and then you scroll again, and you find another one, and another one, and then you just kind of spiral down this vortex of depression and anxiety, right? But through all of our doom scrolling and, you know, just focusing on all of the bad news, every once in a while, on our TV screens and on our, our news feeds, we find some good news. And Nine times out of ten, that good news is rooted in someone who has decided that they're going to leverage what they have, their, their money, their time, their relationships, for the common good of others. Now, let me give you an example. Does anybody know who Taft Foley is? Does that name ring a bell? No? Well, that's all right. Well, Taft Foley, he was uh, an 18-year-old high school senior when... The, the COVID outbreak was first coming in, in the springtime, and he was the youngest EMT in the state of Texas. And what he decided to do is he decided to create a mobile testing site that can provide COVID-19 test results in as little as, as 15 minutes, right? This is a guy that had limited funds, limited resources, but he decided to take what, what little he had and leverage it for the good of his, of his community. And we hear stories like this, and they're inspiring, and they're, they're awesome, and they, they break through all of that junk and all of the clutter of negativity, not because they're common, because they're, but because they're uncommon, right? And the reason these stories gain so much attention is because our visceral response with our money, with our plans, with our relationships is to do this, to be very closed-handed, to be tight-fisted with those things. But those stories that gain so much attraction and attention, they tend to be those stories where people decide, you know what? I'm going to move from doing this to doing this. Now, I don't know this young man's faith and where he is there, but I think this is a beautiful picture of someone leveraging what they have for the common good of others. And so the question is, how do I leverage my money, my plans, my relationships for the common good of others. And I use the word my kind of generously because what scripture teaches is that my money, my plans, my relationships, as well as yours, they're really not ours to begin with. The Psalms tell us the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the, the, the earth and the, the, the fullness thereof, depending on what translation you have. Right? Everything we have, every good thing, the book of James tells us, comes from above. Right? So they're not ours. They belong to God. And so we're to manage them well. And in the church world, we use this word steward. Right? When someone's managing what God has given them well, we say, oh, they're such a good steward. But we don't use that word in any other context in our life, do we? Now, I've never walked into like a business meeting and the boss asks, okay, how are we doing with stewarding our finances? It never gets used. And yet we throw it around in the church world all the time. So what does it mean to be a good steward of what God's given us? Well, it comes from this old English term in the 1200s. And a steward managed the king's household and the king's possessions. So when the king or a lord would, would go away for a period of time, the steward would stay back and would, would look after everything that the king owned. It was never the stewards. It never belonged to them. But it was entrusted to them to care for for a period of time. Right? And the stewards would do that. They would look after the possessions. Sometimes they would do, do uh, taxes and bookkeeping and, and all that fun stuff. 
So if everything we have belongs to God, we should always be asking ourselves, how do I leverage this for the common good of those around me? And we should move, always be moving from being less and less tight-fisted with those things and more and more and more open-handed 